Welcome to Sustain What, a series of conversations seeking solutions where complexity and consequence collide. That's basically on just about every sustainability frontier, from shaping a safer relationship with Earth's climate to building more civil online relationships with each other. As we say here in the Communication Initiative of the Columbia Climate School, the word sustainability has no meaning on its own. The first step towards success is to ask, sustain what, how, and for whom? This program contains audio highlights from hundreds of video webcasts, which you can explore on your own at j.mp slash sustain what live. I'm Dale Willman, Associate Director of Columbia's Initiative on Communication and Sustainability. The webcast was created and is hosted most of the time by Andy Revkin, the longtime environmental journalist, sometime songwriter, and founding director of the initiative. Read his related dispatches at revkin.bulletin.com. And now, sustain what? Hi, this is Andy Revkin. I um, am the founding director of the Initiative on Communication and Sustainability at Columbia University's Earth Institute. And it's a privilege and uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun today to talk with Herman Daly, one of the founding fathers, one of the founding humans of um, steady state economics and Kate Raworth, uh, who's uh, in Oxford and is a, uh, an economist from a new generation uh, charting paths to balancing human ambitions and activities with the limits of living on a finite planet. As, as, you, as many of you know, I ran a blog at the New York Times for nine years called Dot Earth, and that was the framing question. How do you fit uh, nine billion people as we will soon be on a finite planet? And uh, how do you spread well-being? How do you limit risk? Um, and to, to us and to the na nature around us, the, the non-human nature. And here we are now in the midst of uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic, long predicted by many, long ignored by our systems. So I thought it would be really useful to have a conversation with uh, two people thinking deeply, in one case for half a century, about how we can uh, do a little better than we have been. Uh, you know, there's a brittleness to our structures um, that's really been revealed in a profound way right now. Uh, Herman, I'd, I'd love to start with you and just get your sense, first of all, for each of you, I'll ask you, you know, where in the world are you? And just give a quick sense of how this um, uh, epidemic has shaped conditions for you right right now. So Herman, maybe give a hello from Virginia and um, let us know how you're doing there. Okay, uh, <clears throat> well, I'm in uh, Midlothian, Virginia in a retirement home. My wife and I have lived here now for four years. So um, we're not able to get out, of course, uh, like everyone else in Virginia and Maryland, we're sort of on a stay-at-home order, except for very highly necessary trips. And uh, we go to the to the pharmacy, maybe, and to the uh, grocery store, but uh, even that is is rather limited. So that's about where we are. So it's a good time to think and sit around and talk to people. And what's uh, been that, like, what's the top line thing when you wake up in the morning um, after figuring out breakfast and the like, you know, what aspect of this resonates most powerfully with the way you've been thinking about the world? Well, I suppose, um, you know, I think of economics as a life science. And uh, basically the economy is a subsystem of the, of the ecosphere. And largely in ecological economics, we've been trying to uh, make that fit better and to recognize all of the life support systems that we receive from the uh, bio biosphere and, and to not damage them. Now we have to think a little bit more about the disservices that we receive from the larger ecosystem and how to protect ourselves against them. These random changes in, in something is insignificant as a, as a virus in China or anywhere else, uh, roils the stock market and, and brings a shutdown to, uh, to life. So that's rather an enormous change in, in the interdependence in the world, uh, which, well, I think we've not paid sufficient attention to. Yeah. Um, I'm going to broaden the picture here. And, and 
that that issue, you know, I, I was looking back, we rewatched the film Contagion, which had a lot of expert support and uh, how it was written and rereading um, some of the predictive literature about pandemic impacts and the, the economic, the complete shutdown that's required here to um, stall the virus so long enough to control it eventually didn't seem to be adequately uh, foreseen. Uh, maybe you and Kate could th could talk a little bit about that. Is this is the profoundness of how this has shocked the system? Does it feel unsurprising to you, or or did it take well, you by surprise too? Well, I'll just mention what I think we've sort of set ourselves up for such a thing with uh, globalization and the the long uh, supply lines coupled with uh, just-in-time inventories and just-in-time research, just-in-time learning. Everything is stretched thin to maximize uh, current profits. And uh, so, and then, and then globalization, we have interdependence of, through so-called free trade, free capital mobility, increasingly free migration or uncontrolled. And so all of this seems to me to be something that uh, viruses will just say, well, thank you very much. Uh, you've made it easy for us. And, uh, and I think we have inadvertently. Yeah. And then there's this human trait that you've seen kick in almost all the way along the chain from China in the very earliest days, local officials uh, were, were not eager to share bad news up the chain. And uh, that, you see, uh, there's been a lot of reporting at every stage. There's been some issues where the, the human element impeded rapid um, uh, transmission of the knowledge that could have been made, made this a little better. And of course, here in the United States, it's been a bit of a nightmare with disinformation, misinformation. Uh, uh, what someone today was calling on NPR an infodemic, <laughs> paralleling mm -hmm. the pandemic. So well, Kate, <clears throat> Kate in, um, in England, uh, there's been, well, everything from Boris Johnson testing positive to whatever your local situation is. Could you give us just a quick snapshot of how you're, you know, what your community and your family are, how you're dealing with this? And then we can, you can weigh in a little bit on this concept of how it relates to economic thinking. Yeah, sure. So I, I live in Oxford. I moved here in 2001 to work for Oxfam. It became my home. I'm still here. Um, I have 11 year old twins. So the biggest immediate shift in my life is I can't go and visit my parents anymore who live in London and I'm homeschooling. My partner and I are both here, of course, and we are homeschooling our children. So, and my work life is as busy, more busy than ever, desperately working to set up a digital platforms so that collaborators around the world can work with us on putting the tools of donut economics into action. So we're working incredibly hard because of this context and I'm pulled away every day for several hours to go and home for my kids. I live in a street in Oxford that never actually had a community. I didn't really know beyond one or two doors either way who was there. And I've always felt really bereft about that actually. And now we have a WhatsApp group and there is phenomenal community. You're talking about the human traits. I mean, as well as the disinformation and the delay, there is the phenomenal jumping into action and the joy in rediscovering local community people, helping each other, looking out for each other, making jokes. And that for me has been a very positive side, but the combination of working harder than I've ever worked, homeschooling my kids and being part of the community, it's, it reminds me of actually gender theory that I learned when I was at Oxfam of the, what they called you know, the triple burden of, of women's lives. And it's actually not women's lives, it's the caring life of the household, which is to do your work or earn an income, to care for the family and participate in the community. So I feel huge strictures on my time. I, when I wake up in the morning, I'm just into a timetable of moving between those three things. So that's what I'm immediately feeling here. Yeah, that this issue of um, trying to fit the strictures that are required here to get this under control into daily life is so profound. And I've just been uh, reading and connecting, tweeting significantly about the unrealistic expectations in developing countries where um, there's uh, there's been a lot of pushback uh, from folks in uh, India, for example, uh, saying that uh, social distancing is a privilege, that only those of us who have roofs and uh, don't have to walk 100 meters to a well to get the water just to drink, let alone to wash our hands, 
are are just immensely privileged and 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 when you think about uh, Modi's effort to shut down India, 1.3 billion people, not to mention uh, what's happening in Africa shortly, it, it's a profound sense of the world facing um, a multidimensional reality, which actually reflects economics in so many ways too. There's no one economics uh, situation and uh, and how, how do you square that with whether it's climate or these other global challenges is really hard um kate you had on that Andy, that's a really yeah. nice point because people talk about social distancing but actually what it really is is physical distancing exactly right? mm -hmm. and, and so we desperately try to remain social and people who are yeah. privileged to have technologies like the ones we have can do it like this and as you're mm -hmm. talking many millions of people billions of people do not have these but the point you just made is really interesting that if you have in your home running water and um a cooking stove and entertainment like a tv you can physical distance and still enjoy the necessities of life but in many countries people don't have that in their home it's a public service or it's in a public shared common space so just as you said you have to go to the well i'd not thought of that point i think it's a really great point that in, in communities where actually there's a lot of commons and communally shared resources collecting firewood going to the well um even communal TV watching sometimes in the village square, all of that because of physical distancing, a lot of the necessities right. can't be provisioned for. I think that's a really important point. And it also says that, that we're in for a wave of disease that's really going yeah. to be a terrible. It, it, mm -hmm. it reminds me, but it's actually even more extreme than the pieces I wrote back in 2007 on what we call the climate divide. You know, that the impacts of climate change and uh, whether you're rich or poor uh, are enormously different. Um, and of course, the culpability question of, you know, who's emitting most of the greenhouse gases. And yesterday, actually, it was my son in Los Angeles who was saying, you know, here's a disease that was spread by the rich, meaning through transit and commerce and is mostly going to impact the poor uh, through the, that, these issues we just described. Um, I, there's some comments coming in that are pretty good and they help set up the next questions, I think. Um, uh, Baba G is saying this pandemic is the catalyst for the tectonic shifts that are coming. The shift isn't a result of the pandemic. And he also says uh, tectonic shifts in personal transportation, energy production, delivery driven by economics, not by a new love for the environment. Um, and his question, <laughs> how do econ economies deal with these shifts short term as uncertainty leads to the fear, discontentment, anger, and could very well lead to civil unrest promoted by certain governments as a way to challenge energies. Wow. That's a pretty big uh, question. I, I think, let me just frame it slightly crisper, which is, um, is this a moment for for a for an expanded opportunity to, to shape things in a new way? Uh, and Herman, I know we had the same discussion back uh, in the Great Recession. Or is this, um, oh, sorry, I just want to get rid of that comment. Um, or are we still, is this a blip and what's still a long journey to reframing of how we measure progress and the like? Well, <clears throat> I'm just thinking of it in, in more concrete terms here. We just had the uh, Democratic primary elections that have been interrupted, but it seems to me that that uh, the ideas that have dis were discussed in those debates uh, three of them have really come to the prominence, come to prominence in view of the current situation. I mean, I think uh, it's become clear that Bernie Sanders' idea of, uh, or many people's idea of uh, universal health care, single payer health care, that's, I think, harder to argue against now than it was before. Uh, also, I think Andrew Yang in the universal basic income notion. It seems like we've in, enacted already, Congress in, in great haste enacted a, a, a kind of a version of that, a temporary and reduced version of such a thing. And then um, Elizabeth Warren's emphasis on the wealth tax, I think, uh, I think that has gained a lot of prominence in view of the fact that uh, what you, we've just been discussing, the tremendous inequalities, inequities in our country and the fact that the, the burdens are going to fall so much on, on the lower class, the working class, they've just been disemployed in mass. And we've, we've, um, and we've basically, this is a question I raised for 
others to think about too. Uh, we seem to have put the brakes on the real economy in order to avoid contagion, to, to be physically isolated, stay at home. At the same time, we're opening the spigot for the monetary economy to giving the Fed and the banks just, you know, come on, put the money through. And uh, why is that going to be inflationary? Well, I kind of think it will be, uh, or at least I don't understand why it won't be. And um, that may give some further impetus to the idea of the, of the wealth tax. Let's let's uh, turn put on the let's get some of that money out of the system uh, through a wealth tax and redistribute to help finance uh, what we're what we're spending at the lower end. Uh, so those are things that I think might be consequences politically and economically in the short run in the United States uh, of this. I'd be interested in what other people think about that. I, that's just off the top of my head. Yeah, uh, there was a conversation on Friday that a colleague did as part of a resilience journalism training we're just starting to do. Uh, Dale Willman had Nate Hagens from the Post Carbon mm -hmm. Institute on with others, uh, John Erickson and mm -hmm. uh, Juliet Shore. And they all agreed in a way, they weren't, they were saying this is an emergency moment where um, uh, Nate put it pretty crisply, uh, you have to do it all. You've got to get basic income to people and you've got to, you do have to stimulate, uh, save businesses at the same time. You know, wh whether, what strategy you use to do that one. And then he, and he's, then he backed away and said that the bigger challenge will then emerge later, but we're really in a complete, Juliet Shore said the economy, this isn't a recession. It, it's a, it's a stoppage. <laughs> It's yeah. a very, it's a very right. different kind of thing. Yeah, very different, very different. It's, it's uh, you just stopped producing for an, an independent reason to control the contagion. It wasn't mm -hmm. a, a slowdown or a, so. That's very different. Can so, I jump in there and yeah, say? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, Kate. Uh, yeah, yeah, this this point that Herman's bringing up about the difference between the productive economy and the what he was calling the monetary economy. So. I can't resist playing with toys. Okay, so I've got this hose pipe that right now I'm going to say this symbolizes the circular flow of goods and services through the productive economy. So somebody sells coffee in a cafe and then they use that money to go to a yoga lesson. They buy some food. They buy uh, some health care. They could pay for some education. So uh, delivery service by clothing. <laughs> so things are going round and round the economy now just to recognize the landmark uh, insight Herman had. Apologies for this, Fern just taking a bit of natural capital here from my fern. Uh, nature goes into this pipe, okay? This is not a self-sustaining pipe. So let's just recognize that the economy uses natural resources. But what I'm trying to distinguish here is the productive economy of people who depend on salaries, paying for each other's salaries mm -hmm. every time they spend money. That's part of the economy. But I'm gonna say there's a bit of a payments that are coming out of it. And I'm gonna use my little kitchen funnel here that are going over here. These payments are being siphoned off. Where are they going? They're going for rent, they're going for uh, mortgages, and they're going for debt. So it's the financial and the real estate sector who have mm -hmm. the right to produce money as credit that bears interest. It's the rentier landlord, it's the rentier economy that's extracting a rent permanently. And this crisis for me is highlighting the difference in people's source of income between those who depend upon this flow of income between salaries and incomes, and then those who are extracting rent. And what the virus has done through physical distancing is shut this down. You yeah. cannot yeah. circulate. But what is happening here? Are these rents being stopped or are they still being extracted? And the most, ex the most um, striking and different measures that I hear of are, are when governments are actually saying we need a rent freeze, we need uh, interest-free loans, because that means we're beginning to break the presumption that rent can always be collected, that extraction has the first right on capital. And that to me is one of the most um, valuable insights that we're getting now because we can suddenly see the difference between the productive economy and the extractive economy and let's see it and learn yeah. from it and change it. So that's that's the question, Kate, though, I want to ask you a little more to dig in. Is there anything about this moment yet or what you might anticipate that gives you confidence that we can avoid over focusing on that 
what Nate Hagens was describing, meaning getting things going, which we know is essentially sustaining the existing pathways and norms and getting someone to really pay attention to how how to reframe this. I just saw last week, I think OECD was blogging that this is going to make the Marshall Plan look small, hmm. you know, that, that, that globally in terms of how much money is going to flow. And when I write about climate, climate ad adaptation, for example, there's always this tendency to invest climate adaptation finance in, in the things we already know, like building storm barriers, whether or not they're logical or correct. So do you really, what's your sense of what, what it would take to actually have whoever need, who is it who needs to know and what can change their full stop new thing possibility? So as people always say, never let a good crisis go to waste. But yeah. uh, there's always at least two camps with that in mind, right? And there's business as usual, which when it gets collapsed by a crisis, wants to resurrect itself and actually build back stronger, more powerful and more advantageous. And Naomi Klein did a brilliant uh, job of documenting that in the shock doctrine. And then there's the other team, which is saying, hang on, we have a vision of a completely different future that we already know we want. And we can't let this crisis go to waste. And many people right. say that the financial crisis was not capitalized upon because the ideas weren't ready, right? And they and mm -hmm. weren't brought together. Have we done our homework since 2008? Have we started mm -hmm. assembling those ideas so that they are ready? And I would say, actually, I think what part of what's going to determine which way that goes is the big framing ideas, the paradigms that we steer ourselves by, the metaphors we hold in our minds, the pictures we draw for ourselves. And that's why, to be honest, it's a huge privilege for me to be in this conversation with Herman. We've never met before, uh, but his work has influenced my thinking for decades. And I trained as an economist back in the 1990s, and it's only thanks to, and I walked away from it because I thought this mindset is so limited. I'm deeply frustrated. How can we call the death of the living world an externality? That is absurd. And it was only when I picked up this book, Beyond Growth by Herman in the early 2000s, I read it while I was actually doing jury service. So I was going in and out of a court case and while sitting in between that, my brain was turning circles because it had in it concepts and diagrams that I had never been taught. And that set me on the path saying, right, I actually want to be an economist now because I want to help make this economy happen. And you don't just get to make it happen. You have to find moments cracks or great fissures in the system like this one when right. we can bring these ideas which actually have been around for decades yeah. and, and bring back those images so i would love to share some of the images uh the, the, yeah. the one that herman drew uh mm -hmm. that i think so powerfully helps us reframe the paradigm um, and i'll let herman speak to this but this diagram once i'd seen it there's no going back from this image once you see it and you get it and economics can't just put it back in the box can you talk it through a little bit herman um, sure. Maybe there's some children watching this program since they're all out of school, and uh, I'll talk to them in, 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 about this. You know, you probably remember in school they used to give you uh, little puzzle books, and uh, one of the puzzles was always a picture, and the the question would be, what's wrong with this picture? And the picture usually would be pretty reasonable. Everything looked pretty right, but there was something wrong and you had to sit there and think and think and figure out what was wrong with the picture. Well, I've been using this picture as, an, as a way of, of emphasizing the um, um, another picture, the, the faults of another picture, which was the basic circular flow diagram on the first pages of every textbook, where this, you, know, you just go around and around and there's no inputs from nature and no outputs of waste back to nature and so forth. So this was an idea to look at the at the economy in its physical dimensions, respecting the first and second laws of thermodynamics and not contradicting them and, and not making it look like a perpetual motion machine. Well, I've used that. To make that point over and over, I mean, that's diagram is probably 40 years old, and I use it for 20 years teaching. And then one day in class, I guess I was feeling especially uh, unusually self-critical. And so I asked the class, what's wrong with this picture? And so we puzzled over it for a while, and it became 
after a while, I won't go into all the false leads, but you know, what, if you look at just that empty world diagram, what, what is the final product of the economic system in that picture? What is the, what is the end product of everything? Well, it's waste matter and waste energy. And that's it. Right. So the economy is an idiotic system for taking useful matter and energy and grinding it up and converting it into waste matter and energy. That's the physical picture of the economy. So to make sense out of it, you really have to escape from just physical dimensions. And so our what was wrong with the picture is that it it stayed within the physical world. It did not go into a world of experience or sentience or um, uh, welfare or enjoyment of life. So the whole purpose of grinding up all of those useful things into waste is that we have to do that to enjoy life. We are we are uh, what the physicists call dissipative systems, and all of our wealth is a dissipative system. So we have to compensate for the this dissipation, and and uh, and that's the physical part. But so how did we correct this picture? The correction I'd like to make to this picture, which actually we've already made it. Josh Farley and I in our textbook, uh, you know, made it is to draw uh, just to, on the outside of the circle to put welfare. And then we have two sources of welfare, one directly from the economy, an arrow from the economy to welfare outside the circle. And uh, that uh, and then another arrow from the ecosystem, the natural capital, directly to welfare. So we get welfare directly from natural capital. We get directly from uh, economic um, man-made capital. Well, as we as the economy grows, then the arrow representing uh, economic services contributing to welfare, that gets bigger and bigger. And the arrow representing the direct ecosystem services to welfare gets smaller and smaller because the economy crowds out the ecosystem. So that's what really gives an economic dimension to this picture, is that you have two sources of welfare, uh, the E ecosystem services and purely economic services. What we're interested in as economists is, is the sum of the two. It's the total welfare. So we want, uh, we want that size of the economy such that the sum of the services from the, from the economy plus the services from the ecosystem is a maximum. And that's, um, that's what gives an, e an economic dimension. So you, we can go on from there, on and on and yeah, on. Yeah. So, so Herman is being wonderfully self-critical and pointing out what's missing from his diagram. But let me say that myself, as somebody who graduated, oh, flip back to Herman's diagram. Yeah. Somebody who, who had graduated from economics, and I know I did a master's in development economics, but this was absolute seismic mind-shifting stuff. Because in mainstream economics, they say, welcome to economics. It's the literally means the art of managing the household. And on day one, you learn supply and demand. You just dive straight into the market. And it's not bounded by anything but what we call externalities. And when you start here, one, he's drawn the economy as a subset of the living world. And that changes everything. And Herman has a wonderful story about trying to convince the World Bank in their 1992 report to, to, to draw the box of the economy inside a circle. And it, it dis, uh, disturbed them so much, they eventually just took the diagram out because it was such a radical shift. I mean, this is the most radical move you can make in economics to put the economy within a living system and treat it as a bounded system. But the well, second- that, that was, uh, I'm glad to hear that. That was my thought. That's what happened to me. And uh, I'm glad it happens to other people too. Oh my goodness! Yeah, it happened to the World Bank because we went, <laughs> we went over and over, and they, uh, I tried and tried to to get, and I was simply told that's not the right way to look at it. That's not the right way to look at it. And you know, if you look at it that way, it threatens the World Bank 
and many economists, including me earlier, with a question which, you know, you don't want, you can't deal with. Uh, if this is the true picture, then the economy is constrained by a larger system. It cannot grow beyond the boundaries of the larger system. Mm -hmm. You can develop qualitatively, you can improve, you can have better morals, you can have better technology, but you can't keep growing. And, and uh, that was what the World Bank was, is, still is devoted to. And so, and so for that reason, it just, ha it just could not be a part of the World Development Report. It had to be dropped. And, and, and that's where you know you're changing paradigms. When people are so threatened by a mere circle, that's when you know you're on paradigm shift. And if I can say the second thing for me that is so shifting and profound about this is that beautiful contrast between empty world and full world. And Herman's always very generous saying, well, in empty world, maybe it was okay. Maybe it's okay to just sort of uh, not take so much notice of the living world because it always seemed to be so expansive. There was always so much more atmosphere, so much more land. And that sort of generosity of spirit to the founding fathers that maybe they, you know, maybe they could ignore it. Although, of course, through colonialism yeah. and, and, and um, mm -hmm. reliance on the unpaid care economy, they couldn't. But then come to full world and say, how would you know when that square of the economy was banging into the edges of you? How would you know? And how would you be able to describe that circle of ecosystem? I mean, when, when I first saw this, it was it's a concept. It's the carrying capacity. The ecosystem is drawn as a circle. And the, the seismic moment again for me came in 2010. I had just come back from maternity leave. I was sitting at my desk in Oxfam and somebody was running by me all the big ideas that had happened in the, in the previous year. And if you flip to the next slide, Andy, um, it was the planetary boundaries diagram. The Earth System scientists at Stockholm Resilience Center and all over the world had come right. up with these nine planetary boundaries. There's nine life supporting systems within which humanity must live. And, and, and they had quantified it. And they said on, on climate change, it's 350 parts per million. And so that's the outside the donut. And when I saw that, it was like, that is the quantification of Herman Daly's circle. We are now moving somewhere. We've got metrics. We don't have to do everything in the, in the metric of money. We've got alternatives. And I felt like this was the most massive uh, challenge to the mainstream of economics that everything had to be quantified in monetary terms. Actually, here we can do it in natural metrics. And I added the inner boundaries. If there are outer boundaries of pressure on the planet, there are inner boundaries on the pressure of individual lives. And my goodness, mm -hmm. we can do that now. So for me, this was the most um, crucial diagram that helped me start moving in this direction and draw the donut and really give a, give a sort of and keep alive the ecological economics in, in its evolving new diagrams that help people see things in new ways. So thank yeah. you. I think that's a real step forward because it disaggregates the 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 big picture into into a lot of pieces and gives the physical dimensions to them, and it add, as you say it adds that inner boundary too, uh, which was was absent from the original picture. A little bit taken up with the, with introducing welfare, but still this is much more disaggregated and specific. So that's a, that's a nice uh, a really uh, step forward. And if we jump in this picture just briefly to use it, I mean, the, the idea of it is it's about meeting the needs of all people within the means of the planet. Leave nobody falling short in the hole in the middle, but don't overshoot planetary boundaries. We can start to tell the story of what we're experiencing in this pandemic now. It starts with the pressure of human systems, that expansionist growth based human economy. We're continually pushing into nature spaces and we get these zoonotic diseases like Zika, like SARS, like Ebola, like coronavirus. So biodiversity loss. And uh, as, as uh, Herman said, there are disservices that happen when we push too much and create some, such a threat to the wild spaces, we get a massive hit on human health. And that immediately now in this crisis has had a hit on incomes and work and on, on social networks, on people's ability to meet of communities. Suddenly people who live in high income countries, rich cities like this one in Oxford, you go in the supermarket, there's no food on some of the shelves. People who never imagined that they would not be able to buy food in the shops are suddenly experiencing what people experience in low income countries every day. So there's something very equalizing about realizing that we're all vulnerable to the knock on effects of pandemics. Right. There, there is. I want to show this uh, from Twitter. Um, uh, Bill Bow. There, and actually, there's a couple of comments. A lot of comments have come in that I'd like to try to scroll through in a minute. Um, but one thing that Bill has said here. Um, in looking at the great flatten the curve 
uh, uh, graphs that have gone around, some of which actually date back to the 1918 epidemic. There was actually this understanding was was uh, emerged then. Uh, what you see there that it's a little harder to um, capture in uh, the, the more this dimensional graph is, is to the temporal element. You know, we're in a surge and there's a shape to human activity right now. This sort of a, a conversation I had last week with um, Deborah Brosnan, who's a disaster risk uh, expert, was that uh, uh, resilience is is a is a is a an activity. It's a process. It's a it's it's a tie has a time dimension to it. So um, the question here was: uh, Is this graph of healthcare system capacity might this help raise awareness that ecological ceilings and social foundations? Uh, apply across the board. I, it was kind of interesting to see that come up. I don't know if you could both quickly weigh in on on having that dimensionality to it as well. I'll Time. jump in and say the obvious, and then Herman can elaborate on it. Herman created the three uh, conditions for sustainability many decades ago. One, extract Earth's renewable resources no faster than Earth can gen regenerate them. Two, dump pollutions and wastes in Earth's sinks no faster than Earth can assim um, assimilate them or make them harmless. And three, use non-renewable resources no faster than we can find substitutes. And, and what I see here is a, an absolute equivalent. Four, allow infection and pandemic to, or, or allow, allow a virus to spread no faster than humanity has created the capacity to deal with it. So what this curve does, it doesn't say, oh, we'll make sure nobody gets the virus. Right. It, most people are going to get this virus, yeah. but manage it within the carrying capacity. And of course, we can't change Earth's carrying capacity. We can reduce it, but we can't increase nature's generosity. We can increase the capacity of our health systems, and many countries have systematically underinvested in them uh, for decades. And so that capacity is much lower than it could be. And maybe that's one of the big changes that's going to happen. But I'll, I'll love to hear what Herman sees on that. Uh, yeah, I, I guess my thinking, um, you, you triggered it earlier when you talked about India and, and the Modi's uh, rule that everyone goes back to their village. And then I saw on the, on the news all these people crowding into, into buses and trains and, and trying to get back and not having a place to right. stay. And, and so, it, it, you know, economics is uh, the first rule of economics is uh, count the cost. costs in India, you know, is is yeah. the lockdown thing now? You, you've got this devastating threat of the of a widespread pandemic in India, and then the the cure, partial cure that we seem to see is the lockdown, isolate, but then that practically destroys the the low level of livelihood of people who or barely getting by already. And so I, I'm really puzzled with, with this fundamental question of, of um, counting the cost in this situation and how, and at what point do you say, well, it's, um, we'll, we'll just have to let the virus go for a while because we have to stay alive by, by working. And at what point do you say, well, no, the virus is so deadly, we're just going to have to risk upsetting everybody's life and starvation. So yeah. that's um, that's just an expression of personal angst, I guess, or, or yeah. professional incapacity to, to give a good answer. Yeah, I, I tell you, I've been talking to a lot of people in India, in the Himalayas, elsewhere, by, you know, electronically. Um, and I don't think there is an easy answer at the moment, except to uh, understand that in the long run, systems have to be um, shaped in ways that boost capacity on the ground for resilience. Um, and that means basic provisions, basic capacity yeah. to endure a hazard. Uh, yeah. There's so much that I've learned. Sorry, Herman. I was just going to say part of resilience here seems to be to be, uh, to be immunity, uh, developing immunity in this concept of of a herd immunity and how soon that could be developed and uh, and you know whether that's uh, i mean that's reasonable as a statistical statement of probabilities that happens during a during a, a pandemic whether it, it translates into a policy is a big moral question well then 
it's interesting because that was my next question for both of you is um, from models to policy. I, I've been talking to um, more than a few people about this very thing mm -hmm. the last week or two on this new program that, 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 that I launched this video series as a way to ask a lot of people to dig in on, well, how do we have actionable, actionable pathways? And I've had two different people who were former members of the National Security Council here on the show. And, and um, one thing that I'm going to do another program on came up when um, Rod Schoonover, who was a National Intelligence Council analyst, environmental uh, scientist, uh, he said, you know, we had this all in our, there, the threat analyses for four or five years from the intelligence community in the United States said, pandemic, pandemic. <laughs> Um, but it, as he put it, it was on page 21 and, you know, that's, and it gets at this issue of all these competing, um, priorities, you know, energy security, climate, and yeah. And as a journalist, I said, on that's on that's the that webcast, you know, even as a journalist, I, I kind of write about these things and it's almost like I've inoculated myself, you know, I've written about pandemic. I've written about me mega earthquakes. I've written about these things, but then how do, what is what are the action points that can really make that resilience argument embed in development plans and investments and um, education? What does that look like? I'll jump in. So when so resilience is coming up a lot, and and it's a word that's uh, we're going to use a lot more. And I think it's really important to think about different kinds of resilience. So I, I'm going to just distinguish between two kinds. And the one I would call it sounds like deal with it resilience. Uh, Boris Johnson, the UK Prime Minister, about a month ago, he said, well, perhaps as a, way, a nation, we'll just sort of let it sort of a wave of the virus go through the country and we'll sort of take it on the chin, he said. That is the kind of archetype, you know, just deal with it. And, and that puts the onus of resilience on the individual or in the household. And by the way, right. they can't cope with it. And by the way, it turns out the national health system definitely can't cope with it. But what that accepts is we live in a world that's prone to shocks. There are going to be global uh, financial crises, climate crises, health crises. And so just take it on the chin and deal with it. And that pushes the resilience to the level of individuals. And in a world of extraordinary inequality, millions of people suffer appallingly as a result. There is a very different kind of resilience, which I would say, let's call it design for it resilience. And we're not talking about the individual having the responsibility to be resilient in the face of inevitable shock. It's about saying, why are we prone to so many shocks? And I, I really want to pull back and take a global view because we have this expansionist human project of endless economic growth, which means that the, the, normal, the normal process and indeed the, the assumed success of an economy is expanding endlessly. And when we do that, what a surprise, we end up with, with financial crisis, we end up with a climate crisis, we end up with this health crisis. They have common roots at a deep paradigm of expansionism. So I think we, and also deep global connectedness. I think we've just been through peak connection. In July last year, there were 230,000 flights that took off on one day. Wow. I think we need a resilient system and that means we need to look at our economic systems as a whole, come shrink that square in Herman's circle, come back within planetary boundaries. So first of all, let's not kick off all these ecological shocks, but let's make far more resilient human systems. Let's be regenerative, but have far more distributive economies that don't siphon off wealth into the hands of a 1%, but share wealth far more equitably so that communities, when they are faced with shocks, have a more local resilience to turn to. So I want to make sure we don't go for deal with it resilience, we build design for it resilience. And that's a much bigger global question. Totally. Um, and, uh, you know, yes. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you can see, I've tried to rejigger my screen. So there's so many good comments that came in. Can you guys see what's on the left side there? They're, uh, um, they're too small to read. Yeah, I'll I'll try to read off a few of them because there are too many for everyone to answer. Um, let me just go up here. Uh, there were a couple. Of here, oh, here's Salim Ali, who's a he was on this program a few days ago. The main disagreement is that conventional economics assumes uh, good feedback between economic and ecological systems, focuses on measurability, and using economic system as a proxy for ecological systems. 
ecological economics challenges the efficiency of the feedback loops. I guess um, that one thing that's interesting there is that idea of do we have to pull back a little bit from measurement? Does that I could explain a little more of what I mean? Are we being, are we too um, are, are we thinking too yeah. seeking too much clarity or too much quantifiability? Yeah. I think there's a problem in economics. I, I'm, all, I'm all in favor of empiricism, but some things are sort of clear, you know. I mean, you, as, as if you jump out of an airplane, you know, what you really need is a parachute, not an altimeter, you know. <laughs> it's nice to crack your fall, but yeah, I think, right. you know, first principles are sufficient to know the basic direction in which we have to move. And I get I get impatient sometimes with the, with the, uh, oh, well, you know, is it optimal? Uh, can we, how do we measure it? And so forth. You know, we, after a while, you just accept that gravity exists and you don't measure the, the fall of every apple. You know, you just right. take it and, and go from there. I think we're at that point. I think we we know enough to, to constrain growth. And I can't resist uh, the opportunity to ask Kate Rayworth a question. I mean, she's, I, I'm sort of I sort of represent the past. She represents the future. <laughs> and I I've been hoping that more people would uh, you know have the same kinds of uh reactions that she has had. So, you know, I'm I'm a little since I'm retired now, I don't I'm not teaching and I don't have as much contact. Uh but are are there are there colleagues your and your generation who are thinking like you and have had similar epiphanies, you might say, uh, that you have had, and who, and who have had the courage to go to go with it? I mean, I I would like to have been a fly on the wall in your tutorials with uh, Wilfred Beckerman. You know, <laughs> I can. I can I, so it took it took a certain independence of mind and spirit to to do what you had done. How many people do you see in in among your classmates that are doing that? Oh, Wilfred Beckerman. So Wilfred Beckerman wrote a, a, a book in 1973 called "In Defense of Economic Growth." It was a response to the Limits to Growth report, yeah. and he was my tutor. He's also a very dear friend of mine now. Ninety one. He's a very nice man. Lovely. Um, but I don't think he's ever quite forgiven me for disagreeing with him. Um, you'll be glad to know, Herman, that you, and you know that you have created the most important form of economics in decades, which is ecological economics. And there are millions of people around the world who, when they find it, they say, yes, this makes sense to me. I always thought there was something wrong with me because economics didn't make sense. Now I found this. I realized it wasn't me, it was the economics. <laughs> so this makes sense to people. And it's had huge influence. And in, in all the rethinking economics movements, in all the movements being led by young people in universities, this is right up there. But it's not on the curriculum. So when you arrive at university, still today, and I've sat in in classes mm -hmm. in, in universities, Welcome to economics. Here is the market. Let's learn how markets work. Then we can talk about the market and the state. And then let's talk about externalities. The thing that's missing is that the students are not even taught that this is a worldview. So there's not even, you don't even have an awareness that there's another way of thinking. And that's why students in the rethinking economics movement are calling for pluralism. Respect our minds and teach us that there are a plurality of ways of understanding. And perhaps we'll choose the paradigm that makes the most sense to us. But I think that these ideas are having more and more traction, thank goodness, if, if, if nothing else, from these kinds of climate and ecological crises and health crises, that people say, where is a form of economics that actually has the capacity to hold this? They find it in these ideas. Well, um, I'm gonna show you, let me just quickly show you, there's a question that came in that's pretty sure. relevant. Um, Harry, Harry Flint says, I'm studying at NMSC uh, Ecological Economics hopefully next September, and was wondering if you have any suggestions or advice for, of institutions in the UK uh, offering graduates the opportunity to work towards well-being economy. So anything come to mind? Uh, so let me just say that, so fantastic that Harry's up to study eco um, ecological economics, and may many more students discover that is exactly actually the economics that equips them for the 21st century. 
the real challenge, and I, and I teach um, on a master's in environmental change and management in Oxford, and I see students come through, and by the way, of course, they are paying loans for their degrees, so their education is financialized. Yeah. They, they come on our courses, they learn about regenerative economics, uh, circular economy, ecological economics, they say, yes, this is what I want to do. And then when they leave university, they have to pay off their loans. And mm -hmm. the places that are offering them jobs sufficiently well salaried to pay off their loans, want old school economics, want business as usual. So they, they actually often leave in a really existentially challenged situation, which is why Harry's very smart on asking about this. I've just set up Donut Economic Action Lab exactly to be one of the many institutions we need. We need ecosystems of new economic thinking so that people like himself can actually graduate and use the ideas they've learned and be putting them into practice because this is, let's come back to where we began. If there's gonna be a crisis, which way are we going to emerge from this emergency? Yeah. And we need to build up these new ideas and harness the young generation. Thank you for calling me the next generation, Herman. I'm 50. So I look at the young people coming through and say, it's them. Let's harness that new talent coming through and make sure they get to employ the skills they've learned rather than put them in the bag and, and work with old ideas because that's the only place they can pay off their loans. Yeah, that's true. And I, the, the question about you know where he could study uh, I think you you know more than I do, but I think Leeds in uh, has has a program, and in in Europe, uh, in Spain, uh, Barcelona is has a big area. Here in this country, uh, University of Vermont has a re arrangement with York and with McGill University. Their little uh, triad up there, which uh, has programs in ecological e economics, so. I think uh, there there are those possibilities, but just the way things have developed in standard economics departments. I remember when I started teaching many years ago, uh, there was you know you had courses in history of economic thought. You can hardly find a course in the history of economic thought anymore. Yeah. It used to be required. Now it's not even available as an elective. Uh, there used to be courses in comparative economic systems, capitalism, socialism, so forth. Well, now we all know that uh, there's only one alternative. There's no alternative, and it's all uh, the capitalist system. Yeah. And so then that, there, uh, sorry. And, and so the, the space which was occupied by those, and then economic history has fallen out. They've just kicked that out, too. Not rigorous enough. Go over to the history department. Uh, so all of those credit hours that used to be involved there, they've all gone into econometrics and, and higher theory and mathematical uh, economics. So that's, uh, that, that's um, I think, a real tragedy within the teaching of economics. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with theory. I like theory, but they, you, can, you can go overboard with it. And I'll add a last one, that there was a real division between, well, this is macroeconomics and microeconomics, and then you can go and study development economics as if it was a completely different kind of thing. And I think this virus, shocking systems, literally leaving people in many parts of the world uncertain where they're gonna get their food from, their healthcare from, how they're gonna provide their education. I think with, with the vulnerability of our global systems, I think it's going to help uh, Western society, high income countries, what they consider economics for their economies. It's gonna open that up to the fragility, to the resilience conversations to the pandemic network effect conversations that actually are completely normal in low income countries that have, have had Ebola, have had devastating impacts from financial crisis and imposed debt crises. So they right. know that shocks happen. Yeah. We need to recognize that none of us are, de are developed. I've never been to a country that has a right to call itself developed. We're all developing countries now because we need to come back within planetary boundaries or right. meet people's needs or do both of those at the same time. You just reminded me of a post I did on Dot Earth way back when, uh, when the Millennium Development Goals were out, saying, uh, as, and one of my questions was, do the top billion need new goals too? Because when you look back at the all the the Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable Development Goals, they're still mostly focused on the undeveloped quote unquote world, and that uh, mm -hmm. left a big chunk of the impacts uh, on the planet uh, unaddressed. There's a great question. God, a couple more great uh, points here. Mm -hmm. Peter Duran says, uh, where do externalities figure in the attention economy? Is attention a blind spot in donut economics, well-being economics? 
I, I mean, to, to me, that gets back to what I said about the, the fact that we have a new element of the Earth system, which is the information system. And we can see already it's, it's very hackable. Our brains, as um, Shelley, uh, Sherry Turkle at MIT and others have shown very powerfully, are like, distracted and, and hijacked. Uh, attention is hijacked. Um, Tristan Harris's work, um, and, uh, cap recapturing your, your attention. Does, is that model more important than ever, given how decisions or indecision about pandemic behavior are driven by this big swirling mass of social media and the like? Yeah, I, I guess the, um, what do they call it, the sur surveillance economy and the yeah. business of uh, information. That I think this becomes very important. Economists have dealt with this to some degree, but it, uh, information is a um, non-rival good, and uh, it doesn't fit well in the market. And we tried to make it fit in the market by artificially making it scarce and giving patent ownership to certain information and technologies. And I think this is, you see it right now with, well, now I'm, I'm, um, you know, dependent on things like Instacart for art ordering uh, food. And I just saw that Instacart, the employees went on strike and I listened to what they were saying. And uh, they had every reason to strike. I mean, they were really being ripped off by these people who have captured a, a node in the information economy so that they control everything through this bottleneck of information. Uh, and, and then they farm out on really uh, drastic terms, people to work for them to, to, to fit in, to supply the needs of others. Uh, so I, I think this is a this is a real problem, and it's going to going to cause further difficulties. Um, I don't know quite how to how to yeah. say that. the attention economy makes me come back here. Actually, uh, yeah. we, people hang out on Facebook and think they're just there to enjoy posts of their friends, cats, and neighbors, and dogs, and what we're doing, and and actually they're siphoning off something which is your attention and monetizing it through advertising so again there's always you know when something's free you're the product and what is being siphoned off and that's the attention but the power the the the, the impact and the way these technologies are used and the impact they have on us of course depend on what their purpose is and that depends on how they're owned and how they're financed so a platform like facebook is by owned and financed in a way that's there to maximize revenue and that's to capture attention in order to monetize it. But there are other platforms using the very same kind of technology. In mm -hmm. the Netherlands, there's a, a platform called Habet Online. It means neighborhood online. It's a cooperatively owned platform. It's popping up neighborhood to neighborhood. It's financed and owned and governed by the communities who use it. So the point is to circulate useful, valuable information amongst those people. So it's not the platform itself. It's not the the, the means of sharing information. It's how it's owned and governed and yeah. financed that determines what it does with our attention. Exactly. What was the name of that again? Gebet Online. It's one of my few Dutch words. It's G-E-B-I-E-D. Gebet, it looks like, and if you want to say it in English, online. And it's a wonderful platform that neighborhoods mm. are using. Um, and it's like... Uh, community connection without the massive corporates, and it's just a lovely example that it's not that it's in, it's not inherent in the technology, it's how it's purposed, networked, right. governed, owned, and financed, and that makes it all the difference. For sure, mm -hmm. and, and uh, even within Facebook, you do see useful community-driven discussion and discourse. My little tiny town here in the Hudson Valley has Phillipstown locals, and it is the place you it is the town square. It is the place you go to. To see if you heard a loud noise, if the traffic is weird, uh, um, but there the bigger system seems very broken. Meaning, uh, at the larger mm -hmm. scale, um, it's kind of um, mm -hmm. an enormous new challenge is how to how to get this system with the upside a little more dominant. I think it still is overall a positive part of our experience. And right now, with yeah. with the physical distancing. I think there's some. I think some paradigms are being bro broken right now. I think the university model, exactly, just as you all said, you know, the loans that <clears throat> young 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 people have endured, the the debt 
to go to a college and learn uh, mm -hmm. and now seeing how many resources they can uh, uh, exploit online. I, I'm hoping universities don't see this as a, just a temporary patch. You know, we're all on Zoom right now right. We're on StreamYard here and now we'll just go back to the norms. I don't know if you feel like that. System. Yeah, well, my grandchildren now are all taking their university courses online and uh, it looks like that'll go on for at least a while. So it, it may that may change, as you say, the whole the whole paradigm. It may just be uh, a lot more efficient and a lot better. And a lot more connected globally. You know, in other words, uh, <clears throat> I, I think a lot of us in the physically distanced uh, prosperous world really hadn't fully absorbed. Certainly I hadn't fully absorbed until a few days ago, just how profoundly uh, impossible this is in the, the poorest places in the world. I mean, I've known just on, on this broadcast last Sunday, a sheep farmer for rural Massachusetts said most of her friends are not on the, on the information grid and uh, the phone is the vital way that they stay in touch. Uh, uh, but when you look at the situation in India and Nepal, and then of course, Sub-Saharan Africa, our awareness of these gaps in our systems globally, our awareness of Amazon burning and uh, it, it, the, the feedback mechanisms globally are changing in ways that I think are mostly positive, even with uh, Trumpian, you know, and uh, Russian and other efforts to use the system in harmful ways uh, or um, ways that you might not see as productive. I, I think we're poised for... Um, betterment to come to the foreground. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many more questions. Uh, some of them are pretty granular. I noticed that Brian Fitzgerald there happily posted the links. Yeah. You can see. So this all gets archived. People can come back and great. sift for the links. And I'll use Twitter to add some more uh, features like that, which is great. Uh, someone said there's something here. Maybe this is another one, AKA Nextdoor. Well, I don't think community? Nextdoor is owned as a cooperative. So I, it's, it may look like it has the same function, but I think it's crucial. As with any enterprise, you need to ask, how is this owned and how is it financed? And that yeah. will tell you ultimately what it really is trying to do. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind, I'm going to swing through a few. I'm just going to post some of these. And if you have a quick reaction react away and if not we'll just uh, scroll forward a few more and then we'll have some closing thoughts um, um, here's uh, Melanie Valencia says do you expect that after COVID-19 we'll just have more funding for virology vaccines or can we see a systemic change even in economics how do we promote the latter in other words um, this we kind of dealt with this a little earlier, but is there an action point um, that you can see some particular step so, next so week or love, next month? Economists love to talk about vaccines as an example of a public good. And that's kind of often given as one of the archetypal examples of why we need uh, to raise taxes mm -hmm. to pay for public goods that we all will benefit from. But I think it's much more, I mean, yes, we'll, we, I think we will see more funding for vaccines but also for health system capacity, because what this virus is teaching us is that new things will emerge. And of course you want to reduce the time it takes from it emerging to figuring out what it is, to developing a vaccine and then getting that vaccine around so that people are immune and protected to it, against it. But you need a public health system in the middle. And I think one thing we're going to appreciate much more again is how valuable health and healthcare is and care is, right. and it's the kind of thing that when you've got it, you just take it for granted and you just run on it. And when you lose it, it's when we lose our health and our security mm. of health that we recognize it's actually so fundamental to our well-being. And, and so I it, think this is at a global scale, will I, it really should make humanity say, okay, let's scale back our impact in the whole of the living world. We need to make space for the rest of nature. Mm -hmm. And let's invest more in our health and in care for each other. Because when it comes down to it, we realize that's actually what really matters. And it, talking about well-being, this is where our well-being lies. And so many people get purpose and value from being able to care for others if that work is respected. Right. Mm -hmm. And the uh, yes, this concept of one health also, which is the ecological aspect of what you mentioned, uh, that interface between humans and the other non-human systems is key. But also, as you just said, if this doesn't illustrate the power, and, and Herman mentioned this earlier, the 
the the value of a basic capacity of the healthcare system as a system, not necessarily for you as an individual or even as a family, but the socioeconomic impacts now of having an inadequate, inadequate healthcare system capacity are just so vivid for everybody that um, let's hope that message gets through. Herman, there's a question here that really is for you. Uh, and um, uh, Anelia Paneva says, I'd like to get back to the question about the World Bank. Um, would you please elaborate on the key policy implications for the international financial institutions, World Bank, IMF, arising from changing the present growth paradigm? Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> what shall I say? Um, you know, I spent six years at the World Bank, and uh, there are many excellent people who work there, and I'm still friends with some of them. And um, what frustrated me mostly about the bank was that all of the capacity and excellence that they had just didn't add up. It seemed to cancel itself out. And well, it, an example, um, I tried to get a, a question, uh, what is the best thing that the developed countries can do for the poor countries? Multiple choice question, is it A, to grow as fast as possible so that we that the that we will be able to invest more and import more and help their expansion or b is it to uh, contract or uh, to economize on ecological space for the poor countries of the world to grow into mm. up to some level of sufficiency what should be, well, the question couldn't even be asked. I mean, it was already answered and written in stone that you had to grow more and that was going to lift all boats, you know, the rising tide. Right. And so the question it couldn't even be taken seriously. So that's what I think, one thing I think is wrong. The other thing that I, I say about the World Bank and the, and the institution, I have a real problem with globalization. I mean, these institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, they were not created to be instruments of globalization. They were created after World War II in order to help nations do things together which were in their own benefit as nations, to improve trading conditions. But the locus of decision-making and uh, was fundamentally still the nation. And you just wanted to cooperate. Uh, and now when you come in with, say, the, the um, what do they call uh, the World Trade Organization, that has a very different point of view. They want to see a single global economy. They want integration. They, they don't want just internationalization. They want to integrate into one single interdependent economy across the world. And this is what bothers me. I see this with so-called free trade. Well, what does that lead to? That leads to offshoring, loss of jobs, loss of domestic control, uh, uh, then the capital mobility, increased debt, the problem then with migration, which nobody wants to talk about migration, even with even with a virus, you know, migration still an off, off ramp subject you can't deal with. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we're going to have to deal with that. That's part of the the globalization. It's part of the way that microbes uh, transmit themselves. And so, I think there are a whole lot of subjects which have been taboo, not only from the right but also from the left, that they just don't want to talk about that. Uh, we're going to have to start discussing in a rational and calm way. Uh, and, and I hope we will do that. I hope can so I have one, Can I have one thing that uh, I hope, Herman, your number one recommendation to the World Bank is whenever they find themselves drawing a diagram of the economy, just draw a circle around it and label it the living <laughs> world. <laughs> yeah, um, right. Um, I, I, Kate had also encouraged me to show this. Uh, 
slide, which feels uh, like a useful way to start to close out the conversation here. And I can't tell you how many comments and questions came in that you actually, Kate and Herman, if you want to, you can explore them on Facebook and uh, the other platforms later. Um, but uh, so, Kate, do you want to maybe both of you offer a final thought about where we are at with this? It, to me, uh, in 2000, December 2004, I covered the uh, Indian Ocean tsunami as it was unfolding. I was given the task of writing the big, what's called a TikTok, the big story, pulling in reporting from around the world from our Times reporters uh, and putting together a chronology. And I focused it on the scientist in Seattle who was trying frantically to run a model fast enough that he could warn Sri Lanka or warn Kenya in ways that could be actionable. And, and he uh, was, the clock beat him for sure. It was a tsunami. And here we have a microbial tsunami that is, again, was predicted in some ways. The, the issues, the capacities that could make it a different outcome were clear. Um, we failed in large ways that are still going to be unfolding for months to come, longer than months. So thinking about that versus uh, this uh, Mobius strip <laughs> vision, of, of um, a more dynamic, iterative learning model of with no end point, which I think is valuable. What what would each of you say is a message to uh, either the um, young scholars who are here on the line or uh, the older folk about a way to prod us um, actionably? I'll care. jump in because this this right. is you put on the screen that something I sent you earlier, and I now see that I wrote Hollings wrong. It's not Hulling; it's H O. It's Buzz Hollings' uh, diagram. Of, uh, Buzz, it's okay. my, my fault. It's Buzz Hollings' diagram of the adaptive cycle. I find I, I have been thinking about this picture so often in recent days. Um, it comes from systems thinking, resilience thinking, and so just to give it a quick introduction. The idea of up the side is systems that have more potential to become what they want to become. And then there's more connectedness, more networks and um, more complexity going along the bottom. Let's start down in the bottom left hand corner, R, right? A system wants to exploit opportunity and it goes up that curve. Now, <laughs> that shape, whoop, that is the growth curve. That is exponential growth with those arrows totting up it. And we can have a long conversation about when this exploitation of human societies, of human economies began. We could go back many, many hundreds of years, but we can certainly see a measurement point around the 1950s when, and, and people have called it the great acceleration of just GDP and humanity's use of all resources and carbon emissions, da, 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 we've gone up. <laughs> so we've been accelerating up this curve. And I think the fundamental, one of the fundamental problems with mainstream economics is it believes that this curve upwards is the normal and it will continue and can and will and should continue forever. What this thinking, and I love that Herman began by saying, I think of economics as a life science. So let's take this diagram from life science, which would say, oh, by the way, economists, see this phase that we think we are always in? Um, Life scientists will tell you it's just a phase. And, and at the top, there's something called conservation, which sounds good. We could also call it um, brittleness, uh, which, which creates a fragility because, oh, there we're a clean one. When, when we get brittle, we get less, less able to adapt and cope with shocks. And I feel that, I mean, who knows where we are on this system? And there are micro ones going on and massive long system ones, mm -hmm. but I just can't help but think, since 1950, exploitation, up that a great acceleration. And then since around 2000, financial crisis, climate crisis, right. uh, extraordinary levels of inequality that make a brittleness and a fragility. And then coronavirus just feels whoo, it's kicking us around this curve. Right. And I'll be honest, yesterday I saw on Twitter from Vinay Gupta, who's just a, a, a very brilliant systems thinker. He tweeted, hey, everybody, you need to turn your attention over here. Two things. The World Food and Agricultural Organization saying there are new swarms of locusts forming in the Horn of Africa, right. about to mm -hmm. decimate crops there. And some nations have begun um, putting export bans on crops. So Kazakhstan is not exporting wheat. Vietnam has put on temporary export bans on rice. I'll be very honest. I went very, very quiet yesterday when I saw this because you think, yeah. oh, my God, here comes another one. And, and I just feel like we're 
going round this, and let's be very honest, some people experience this far, far worse than others. And I'm sitting here in the UK in a very privileged position that um, it's not likely to devastate my life personally, but my goodness, that is a very painful process of release. But if, if we are heading for something that we could call release, therein lies possibility because it shoots through to reorganization. And this brings us back to in a crisis, do we rebuild the old? Will it just take us back around this loop of mainstream capitalism that just has that extractive quality again? Or can we reorganize and can we bring in ideas like Herman's that have been waiting for decades to be the framing paradigms of our generations? And this is certainly what I'm dedicating my life's work towards is to help make those ideas the ones that sing through, that make sense, that speak to policymakers so that we can reorganize this in a way that actually create something much richer for humanity that we can thrive within the living world. Mm -hmm. And Herman, you get the last word on this. Uh, do you feel you, uh, you're in your 80s and uh, does this feel like a, a moment of possibility for you or uh, do you still feel a little bit uh, in the wilderness? <laughs> I'm in the wilderness, but the, but the wilderness is being destroyed. So I'm coming out of it in, involuntarily, I guess. Uh, no, but I, this is encouraging, and I, and I'm encouraged by another thing. I mean, I I asked Kay a minute ago if there were any, how many people in her generation were sort of like her, and I've I've discovered uh, one at least another very important in China. There's a uh, even though China is totally dedicated to growth, there are some economists in China who have become ecological economists uh, out of their own traditions and also borrowing from the West. And um, I um, at, at Peking University, and they've had a conference, uh, which I think has made a big step forward in 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 that world. So I think there are things that are happening, and uh, I so I'm very pleased by that, and and I'm I'm hopeful that that will uh, that that will continue. And goodness knows, I mean, we have a long tradition in economics going back to John Stuart Mill and others. There's a whole, or even before that, that that economists can can draw upon. And uh, let, let's get back to the history of economic thought and and break out of this little box of the present only and and look to what people have thought in the past and it was um, a lot of it was very good so that's kind of what i what i'm thinking wonderful well this has been uh, a rare treat and uh, from the looks of the comments and the the, the viewership um, there's thirst for more i, I we might want to try to revisit um, in a month or two and uh, check in on how things are going if, if you great. if you any if either of you see something cross your radar that uh, begs uh, being discussed uh, renewing the discussion, we should do that. Um, mm -hmm. I did flash there very briefly. One of the promising signs I've seen is that there is this adaptive capacity concept has con there's convergence around it from the field fields uh, very different fields um, as as Kate was describing, and then I mentioned. Let me see if I can just post it one more time. Um, the um, there's uh, in in folks like Susie Moser who have been involved in disaster risk reduction resilience work uh, around climate for decades. Susie's new uh, pushes on the adaptive mind. How how can we build the capacity for dealing with constant traumatic and transformative change? You know, change is changing. The the um, the pace of everything, the dimensionality is changing um, in ways that are normal, right? But we're and we're we're not catching up with that at all. So, what do you do in the meantime with your your mental state, and how do you how do you ground yourself as you pursue these questions? Um, and I just think that the more we can talk this through and share and shape and get it into curricula, and by the way, not just at the higher education level, but down down lower, so kids are able to think. And that's one of the great aspects of Kate's work is it's transferable. Uh, there, there are games built around it. I, I showed on Twitter, uh, there's a tabletop game you can play, the donut economics game. And you're both, uh, you know, carrying it on a tradition of examining norms and pushing forward toward um, a new world that will always be a work in progress. So thanks so much for 
joining me uh, on this to sustain what broadcast. I, I call it sustain what because even though the word sustainability is in the name of my program here, I, I think you have to start always with the question, sustain what? Hey, that's very good. I, I really like sustain what. I mean, sustainability, those abstract nouns are hard to pin down. Right. But you've you've gone all the way to a transitive verb, you know. <laughs> sustain something, sustain something else, you know, and it's right. the ecosystem that sustains the economy. And and I think your work makes that clear. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, Herman. It's wonderful to visit with you. Stay safe there. Um, nursing homes are kind of the the front line right now, sadly, and yeah. um, re retirement communities. And mm -hmm. and Kate. Keep at, keep up the good work. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Fun. This has been a huge privilege, and I would absolutely love to come back and have a conversation some month's time. We we will all see things and know things and think things we can't quite imagine right now. There you go. Thank you all, and thanks for uh, tuning in, everybody. Um, I'll be following up. I'm sure Kate will on Twitter and a little bit on Facebook, much more on Twitter. So at Revkin and at Kate at, at Kate Rayworth, Ray right? Is it Rayworth yeah. or Rawworth? It's Rayworth. 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 Okay. Rayworth. Great. Be well. Thank you for listening to Sustain What, a production of the Initiative on Communication and Sustainability at Columbia University's Climate School. If you like, send your feedback or ideas for future shows to j.mp slash sustainwhatfeedback. Thanks again for listening. Stay safe and build a better world. <laughs> <laughs>